I'm Jose Almeida. I'm going to go ahead and moderate uh, this session. And what I'd like to do here today, we just uh, wrote a book and are about to launch it. The book is called Sumner's Hemodynamic Guide to Venous Diagnosis and Intervention. And I'm going to see if this shows up on the screen well. <laughs> this is the book called Hemodynamics for Surgeons, published by Strandis and Sumner in 1975. It's a reference source to all of us, and it's never had a second edition. So, uh, Raj, you, you called us and uh, you had a vision for this. And then we all went to St. Louis in uh, 2018 and, and met with Miss Sumner. Why don't you tell us what was cooking in your mind? Because uh, I, I think hopefully we've accomplished that um, when you reached out to us. I'm, I'm glad that you uh, had a headshot of that book. So during that time when we were in practice, that was the Bible. And it was a unique book. There were books on the clinical side, like Rutherford's textbook. But if you wanted to be a scientist in vascular surgery, the green book of Sumner and Strandness was the one to go to. And it had three components. It had a very strong basic side. Yeah, it was first and foremost, he would explain the basic uh, bioengineering behind the behavior of uh, arterial and particularly venous disease was my interest. And then he would describe the clinical features. And then lastly, he would go into investigational methods. And he had a you know, the, the book is a sprawling book. If you read it, your initial impression is that it is not well organized because it's so spread out. But then you read it a second time and a third time and a fourth time. Incidentally, it takes three or four times to absorb everything there is in that book. He had the knack of summarizing the state of the art he had a knack of telling you what is not known and what needs to be done. All in one chapter. You don't realize it while you are reading it, but then once you are through with it, you know he has laid the foundation of what we know and then has laid the research path for future progress. It's a very unique book in that way. His wife, Mrs. Sumner, has been uh, asking him to redo the book. That was a, that was a request from a lot of uh, surgeons and trainees that whether he would update the book. Dr. Sumner was a very meticulous man. He didn't do anything slipshod. Either he did it well or not at all. So there was some time spent in preparing for the next edition. Unfortunately, his health problems intervened and the book never got finished. And uh, after his passing, uh, Ms. Sumner uh, wished that the book would continue as a memorial to him. And she had, as a matter of fact, uh, allowed a sub sub publication of a Japanese version of some portions of the book to spread this message. So the, the, the drive was to propagate what he started and continue his interest. Now, looking for, I knew I couldn't do it because it was an enormous effort. And I was at a stage in my life where that I would not have been able to do a good job at it. And simply, there might not have been time to finish it. So, of, uh, we scoured through uh, with uh, friends, uh, Boya Clough and Kista were part of this. And uh, we talked through who might. Uh, and then Dr. Almeida was, was, was a perfect, uh, perfect choice for this job. He was. Uh, uh, we knew that he, was, he had a wide base of knowledge, he had enormous energy and drive, and interested in the disease. 
and uh, interested in the scientific aspects. So I thought uh, if you would take it, uh, that would be great. And uh, I was grateful he said yes. And then we had, uh, uh, we had choices for the basic science and the clinical investigational side as well. I have known Dr. Kassab, uh, Kassab too in the last few years and uh, is undoubtedly one of the best bioengineers uh, today in the country. And uh, uh, I don't know how many of you know Dr. Fung, often, uh, often cited as the father of bioengineering in, uh, in this country, father of bioengineering worldwide for that matter. And um, apparently he was an engineer in Caltech and interested in aerodynamics and uh, fluid flow, blood flow and aerodynamics are kind of uh, uh, related and at some point in his career he decided to switch and uh, move to San Diego, University of San Diego and San Diego became the world center of bioengineering. And certainly in this country, <clears throat> and attracted a lot of bright students. And Dr. Kassab was his uh, uh, last, uh, last uh, trainee, I believe. And uh, Dr. Fung was very fond of him. And uh, I, I, I came to know him when I was president of American Venus Forum. I thought we were too clinically oriented. We should have a basic side. So I made contact with him and he started participating in our meetings. And we became, became very clear pretty soon that he was as brilliant as one would have, one would have expected from his background and training. And we were fortunate for him to say yes, to address the basic side. And Frieder, of course, is uh, is well known in the Venus field for his contributions to investigational techniques in Venus disease, including duplex and other techniques. So we collaborated him and I believe we came up with a perfect team. And I have seen the initial, initial run outs of the book and I would say our dream is about to come true. So, Ghassan, um, remember when we uh, were charged with this project, you know, we, we, you and I spoke a few times, um, kind of getting to know each other. I've, I've, I've seen you speak on mostly your experience with coronaries, you know, at, at American Venus Forum and all these principles of, uh, you know, flow divergence and Murray's Law and these things that we were all interested in. And as we went back and forth, you know, there's so many gaps currently and uh, we discussed really that the basics of reflux and obstruction and venous hypertension and what does all that mean? What is, I, I, you know, venous hypertension, I, I still don't know exactly w what it means or, you know, the, the, the more you learn about it, the, the more questions come up. So it's just this, this rabbit hole that never ends that we're all, we've all experienced. Um, but you wrote the first seven chapters of the book. It's an introductory on basic science. Um, the first chapter, you, you really show your depth in, in mathematics and, and calculus, how you start deriving equations, which, you know, just started going by me. But as the, uh, the chapters develop, you know, we start seeing collapsible tubes and boundary conditions and looking at this more as a network and uh you know for me so we have really two areas of focus as far as treatment in the venous space one is venous obstruction namely the iliac vein and placing stents and the other one is saphenous vein reflux and saphenous vein ablation for folks with varicose veins those those are like the two uh crux of course all the, the peripheral issues but uh, those are the two things that we treat most and are trying to understand better of 
you know, why we treat it and why it works and why and when it doesn't work and how to select patients. And um, so your contribution has, has been great. I've just thought about this whole thing, you know, a lot differently. Uh, even, you know, iliac vein stenting, or what I thought the flexible stent, like, like the new Cook stent may not be the the right choice because you hear about the radial force and chronic outward force and it needs to be a perfect circle that we call aspect ratio and then i start reading your chapters and of course the, it outflows into the vena cava which is typically spherical and flat so why are we you know making this vein round and dumping it into a, an elliptical vein and, and all the fuss of uh getting a perfect circle in the iliacs and what that means hemodynamically with flow and cells equation and, and and all these things and the same on the reflux side you know what is meaningful reflux how does a calf pump handle it when do you overwhelm the calf pump there's so many patients that have reflux that don't have symptoms and others with minimal reflux that have major symptoms uh you know all these things so just you know from your point of view you 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 these, these clinicians uh, jump on you and and you're a biomedical engineer and how you went through the process of uh, trying to figure out what we wanted out of reflux and obstruction. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jose. Well, uh, in, you're asking me some granular questions. I'm gonna kind of zoom up yeah. and then come back uh, down. Uh, in, in regards to Dr. Sumner, when I first looked at his book, it looked to me like an engineer in a white coat. So I, I was very, very impressed with, you know, his ability to handle analytical equations and so on. And as, as uh, Raj mentioned, uh, you know, he, he knew calculus brilliantly and tried to express uh, ideas quantitatively. So what makes a surgeon jump in the boots of a an engineer? And then I would say, what makes an engineer jump in the boots of understanding the clinical world? That connects to IC Fung, as, uh, as Raj mentioned. Raj, I'm not sure if, if you're aware, he had a very established career, as you know, as an aeronautical engineer. The reason he moved into biomedical engineering is when his mother developed glycoma. So, <laughs> so at that time, um, he wanted to study, before that, he had no idea, you really, uh, you know, other other than what we take as undergraduates about physiology and so on. In fact, his undergraduate was also in engineering. And at that time, it was during China's period where he felt nationally to help aeronautical engineering was the area, you know, help them build aircraft. So really had very little uh, biology or physiology background. But it was when his mother got sick that he started to read the literature on glycoma and was starting to translate that literature to her surgeon, her physician, and to his mother. So he was he would write these long letters, uh, you know, back to China when it, where his mother was when when he was here at at Caltech. And and I think the the realization he made was what engineers you know appreciate as as something being analytical sort of precise that they know with mathematical precision uh, he's at that time and this is I have to keep in mind this is back in the 60s physiology uh, although we had the guidance and, and others that were certainly taking very analytical approaches there was much to be done in terms of expressing things through laws of physics, right? The same laws of physics that apply to a shuttle or a bridge apply to our bodies too. So, so that's what sort of got his interest. And, and, and he was a wise person. I think he had felt that he had made as much of a contribution in aeronautical engineering really there were lots of white space in 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 medicine and bioengineering and what he became you know uh known as the father of biomechanics as you modern father of biomechanics uh as as you as you noted now uh, kind of so so that's where physician tries to become an engineer and engineer tries to understand medicine there is a beauty there right there's cross fertilization there because we're not separated if you look at biomechanics itself as the term uh, suggests bio is life and mechanics is a branch of physics that studies motion and the forces that cause those motion right so it's it's a combination of of the two the problems that Jose mentioned, such as, you know, obstruction and reflux or, or any problem in general, 
uh, one has to take a systematic approach to understanding those. And we call that the, you know, the biomechanical approach or the bioengineering approach. That requires certain pillars. So let me give you some examples that, you know, we're all familiar with. You know, if, if you if an engineer has to design a bridge or a space shuttle or, or automobile, they clearly need to understand the structure or the geometry of the system. To, to us in the medical side, we call that anatomy. So, so that means you have to really know anatomy intimately, right? Um, in, in our case, the vascular system, right? Uh, the irrigation system, if, if you will, that delivers blood flow and collects it. By that, I don't mean just generally understanding it. You really have to understand the circuit, right? It, it's like an electrical engineer trying to wire a radio, unless they know all the R's and the C's and the resistors and the capacitors and how they intimately connect, you're not gonna be able to produce the kind of function you need, right? You know, just generally knowing, okay, there is a branch here and there are some side branches, it's inadequate. The connectivity is important. The, uh, the, the detailed anatomy is important. So that's one pillar, that's one foundation. On top of that, the, that engineer going back to engineer that's designing a bridge, they have to know what are the material components of that bridge. <laughs> is it stainless steel? Is it copper? Is it uh, cement? What are you, what are you basing uh, the, the mechanics? What has to sustain and resist the stresses, the loads that are being imposed on it? So those are the mechanic, the material properties. And, and in fact, I think that's an area that's just not well understood even to this day is how material properties a blood vessels generally certainly veins specifically because it's it's uh, there are nonlinear properties of these structures one like we're not like stainless steel not only that but the material can change itself it can adapt something that uh you know concrete doesn't do stainless steel doesn't do right you you stress it it stays the same here we have very interesting uh, properties. We have time dependent properties. We have viscoelasticity. We have growth and remodeling. If you push more flow through, you'll get more branches. If you cut down the flow, you lose branches. Uh, so all of that is, is absolutely necessary for a rational, honest analysis. So, so geometry, anatomy, material properties. Now, it, to solve a, an equation mathematically, one needs to know what what are the initial conditions? Meaning, where does the system start in time? That's important. One also has to know what are the boundary conditions? So in space, so you need time and you need space. So in, in the case of uh, the Venus system, uh, there are lots of interactions with the surrounding tissue, right? There is the calf pump that Jose alluded to. Oh, well, that's very important, right? Uh, that's interacting with the blood vessels, the vessels that um, you know are collapsible. That creates very interesting uh, dynamics where collapse is possible in some places. It isn't in in other places. Uh, but also interaction with the heart, obviously, uh, where the venous system ends up draining, right? What goes on in the right side of the heart is extremely important. What happens with respiration? That's another boundary condition. The uh, variation in abdominal pressure, that's another bound boundary condition. So those have to be prescribed. Mathematically, if you have an equation that's uh, first order, then you you only can prescribe one condition. If it's second order, you have to prescribe two. If it's third order, you have to prescribe three, and so on. So if you if you don't prescribe uh, if you don't prescribe enough conditions, you'll have infinitely many solutions. In other words, you didn't constrain it enough. If you constrain it too much, you have no solution. So uh, these are sort of ma mathematical, uh, you know, um, what, what we call uh, well-posed boundary value problems. A well-posed boundary uh, value problem has just the right conditions uh, for a solution uh, to be predictive and to be uh, realistic. So, so these are sort of all the ingredients. So what we've tried to do in the book through those uh, seven 
different chapters or so is lay down these things. You know, one chapter just talks about basic uh, mechanics and what are the basic principles of physics. One chapter, that's that's the physical side, that's the mechanic side. The other chapter talks about the biology and how biology interacts with the physics. So that's the mechano transduction. We have a chapter on mechanical properties, on boundary conditions. And then we give some examples of solution of some boundary value problems. Again, really to try to provide more insights. Do we know it all? We don't. Do we understand it all? No. But goal, the goal really of this book is, is to point out what are the gaps? Where, where, where is it essential to add more information? I, I mean, I can tell you from Fedor's work, I've learned a great deal, um, you know, from Raj, from uh, Jose, you know, the valve work that we've done that we can do as engineers, we can do computational modeling and understand the valve mechanics, but without Fedor's seminal measurements that are based on patient data to help us inform our models and help us be critical of our predictions, uh, we, you know, we, we can make advances. So, really my my hope and my message in this and my excitement in in joining you know a group of great people is is really to bring more attention to the need to collaborate you know between the clinicians the scientists the researchers and the engineers because that's really these problems are so complex it requires this sort of a you know convergence <laughs> of many of, of many fields and so I, you know, was I'm not sure if I answered your yeah, question no, that's great. No. specifically, no, but, but uh, this, I wanted this. to give you some large brush strokes because we're yeah. we've yet. I think we have a, a long ways to go, but I think we've also made uh, great progress, and I hope that this book will be helpful in this way. Yeah. yeah before we get to Fedor, you know, one thing we wanted to do was kind of preserve the spirit of the Sumner book, and. Uh, I think we all incorporated some of the the original writing and then added on what we thought was you know more newer material. Um, but yeah, as Raj alluded to, when you, when you go through the book for the first time, it, it is a strange organization that I was kind of and and the, and the way it all reads, but the uh, but the writing is brilliant. I've never read anything like it. Just the way it's, it's put together and 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 the amount of information they got from very small you know clinical studies if you look at the graphs and and the and the charts they provide you know six patients were studied and we looked at these few things and here it is charted out and they made all these brilliant deductions from these uh, small experiments that uh, today you know i haven't read anything like that comparable so you know when i was trying to put together my piece you know, the, the clinical stuff I felt was all kind of stale and uh, and I haven't found much new in the way of hemodynamics except for Raj's work. You know, when I look at hemodynamics, I think of uh, Andrew Nicolaides and uh, and Raju and Nicolaides more 70s, 80s, even early 90s on APG. But Raj just keeps churning it out. So as I was putting my part together, I kind of felt like Sumner and Raju, I was just pulling down Raj's, all of his papers and uh, trying to, you know, interweave it all. And I felt like, you know, I have, I really have no original contribution to any of this. I'm just <laughs> plagiarizing these big people and these projects trying to synthesize and put it together. But I, I think we did preserve the original spirit of Sumner and introduced you know what we know now and of course there are i got many more questions now than when i started so there's you know more to do but the uh you know the raju contributions on that hemodynamics that can't be overlooked because uh and he, just this month's jvsvl there's two papers from you again raj on on uh iliac so you're a machine so fedor we kind of uh thought that you would be uh, the person on, on the diagnostic side. You've written a lot on duplex and very nuanced uh, things like, you know, time of day when you study people and uh, whether they're upright or supine. Of course, you've done a lot of valve work. Uh, you were out in Hawaii with uh, with Kistner and, and, uh, and Bo Ekloff, seeing what went on clinically, which is one of these uh, iconic 
you know, places in venous disease. I think many of us feel that Robert Kistner was uh, one of the, you know, the grandfathers of, of venous disease. Uh, he got me interested. Uh, when I was a vascular fellow, he was a visiting professor uh, at University of Missouri at Mizzou and the clinical fellow, which I was at the time, is responsible for taking on the visiting professor, preparing something on the work that he does and then presenting it in front of the whole department. So he came in, I thought, man, I'm here to do aortas. You know, what the, the hell is this Venus guy? And I picked him up at the airport. And the first question he asked me, do veins exist here? And I just, <laughs> you know, what? I'm a young kid. I mean, what the hell is this guy talking about? And of course, we all know now what he meant. The Venus is a bastard stepchild of arterial disease. But uh, I prepared this Venus lecture for the department and I was taken back on how cool veins were. And that's really what started it for me. So uh, Fedora, you had a long history with, with Kistner and Ekloff, two of the giants in the field, and you've done a lot of work. So tell us uh, how you approached uh, your your piece of the book here. Uh, well, Fede, thanks. Uh, I, it's interesting that uh, you turn uh, the discussion around exactly to the di direction that I was thinking about. You know, yeah, right. Uh, uh, you know, the, my entire career was influenced by a few people very heavily. Of course, Bob Kistner. Uh, I was fortunate to work with him for a number of years very closely. But even before that, uh, you know, I started, uh, I was given the veins. You said, do veins exist here? When I was, uh, a, a, you know, junior faculty in the vascular surgery department, uh, the veins didn't exist there at all. And, and, then, uh, and then the department uh, chair heard somewhere talk about Kistner's uh, valve reconstruction he gave me as a punishment for my bad behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and Raj may not remember that, but I wrote uh, two letters to three people of which all three responded and gave me really a start. And the issue was, uh, it was uh, Raju, it was uh, Victor Saturai, and, and Bob Kistner. Yeah, and so and then we re later reconnected. But then in 1996, I met Dr. Sumner. And as Raj beautifully described, he immediately became my mentor. And his mentorship style is probably impossible to replicate because what he did is he became my friend. Uh, even more, Marty, his wife, became friends with uh, Galina, my wife, and uh, it uh, it became our scientific discussion became a, a dinner table discussions uh, very softly. And uh, the way it was structured by David was that we turn around the, the what vascular diseases in the in the discussion about uh, biology versus physics and uh, it uh, every single time i try to make some convincing argument he will question that and he will say how do you know that well where are those mistakes and then uh, when i uh, was preparing my first paper i sent draft to him and within about 20 minutes i get a fax back uh, a page with no words just equations pointing out that every single measurement error I could make. <laughs> and I was trying to get that spirit uh, when we described, because what uh, Dr. Sarmer was focused is not just what we know and we don't know, what, but where can we make an error? Where it is that we overstate in what we know, how can we advance the field? So I think, uh, my take on this among many, I mean, it by no means is the only um, way that uh, uh, Dr. Sumner did things, but that was very important for me to keep uh, in the spirit of the chapter on the imaging, because uh, we very frequently see imaging as something true. Well, this another aspect of this. Uh, uh, from uh, from whatever I know from 1996, when I first met Dr. Sumner, he was a photographer at that time. He was taking picture of everything that he see. 
And at one point I asked him, so what with so many pictures, what are you trying to, to do? And he said, you know, I've been trying to see what's real and what I think. And every time I, I see a flower, and I think it's big like this, and it smells and everything. And then I take a picture and look at the picture, and it's actually not what I thought before. And then, you know, when later on he started painting, and his paintings is also, a, 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 in a way, it's a trying to show you what's true in the nature, what's beautiful, what's not. So he was always on, on this quest to to find out what is true and what is a perception. So, so that's, uh, in in a brief, that's pretty much the, you ask what the spirit uh, uh, yeah. of Dr. Sun is writing, I was trying to uh, to keep in my chapters that that's what it was. So um, as, as we start wrapping up, why don't we go around and we'll let Dr. Raju finish with, with the final points, but, uh, you know, I, I met Dr. Sumner also when, uh, you know, he was at Southern Illinois University. And when I was interviewing for Vasker Fellowships in 94, uh, I went out there and uh, uh, Kim Hodgson and Mark Matos were with him. And when I left the place, uh, you know, they were really heavy into endovascular. And that was, you know, so I was I'm coming out of University of Miami here, a big trauma thing, and I wanted, I went into Vasker to do aortis, like we all do, open, big incisions, thoracic abdominal, and they're doing all this catheter stuff, and I'm, and I'm like, walked away like, ah, yeah, I don't want it. And of course, fast forward, and again, they were ahead of the game because everything's endo now, but I found Sumner to be a very gentle type of giant, and. Uh, very welcoming and I, I felt good there I, but I uh, uh, you know I, I saw things in a different way uh, with open surgery back then but you know the audience for this book we, we've talked about and uh, sure Venus clinicians but as we know in the Venus space it's become very device centric there's a lot of stakeholders now you know, there's insurance, everybody's got, it's become, you know, medicine's big business now. It's become a business thing. And there's all kinds of middlemen and people looking at it from different angles as far as, you know, what to pay for and reimburse, how to innovate, how to get through the FDA process, uh, you know, what's required. And it's become very difficult. So, you know, when, when part of what we want for the book, it's not just a clinical Venus audience, but Maybe engineers can look at it, and uh, as Gassan was alluding to, to, to keep collaborating. We we thought it's detailed and broad enough that maybe a device manufacturer would look in here and oh, okay, now we see where where, where they're having issues, and here's a uh, basic science basis uh, illustrated by by a biomedical engineer on on how to look at this and perhaps help us solve the problems. Uh, there's some uh, procedural things on how we do things currently, and uh, maybe that would add to a, a, an engineer looking at this. Well, the options for, for reflux are these uh, thermal devices, non-thermal devices. You can do traditional surgery. You can do sclerotherapy. Here's the problems with recurrence. Uh, how do you select the patients? Where does it work? Where does it not? Same with the obstruction side, which is more in its infancy. Uh, you know, what uh, what do we look for in a stent? Uh, what are the material characteristics that are more suitable for the venous system? How does it interact with the arterial system? What are the long-term follow-up? What are the complications? What happens to these stents over time? What if they're post-thrombotic? What are, so we, we you know we went into thrombosis, we go into not you know primary disease, which is non-thrombotic, secondary disease, which is post-thrombotic. We look at the heart. I mean, I learned things reading because I didn't know that the right atrium also sucked when it dilated. I, I did not know that. I thought it was this passive organ that just mm -hmm. the venous flow, you know, the preload kind of dumped in there and then the ventricle took on all the mechanical duties of uh, contraction. But um, it's really a complicated system. And I, I, I left there with, you know, after we were done with this, looking back, I already 
you know, as we're going through the copy edit process, I'm already thinking to myself, man, I should have included all these things now. <laughs> and I wish I would have done this and, uh, you know, missed that. And uh, so I think there's room for, for a new edition in the future, which is, of course, we're wiped out from this one, but get this one rolling. But so, Gassan, how do you think a biomedical audience uh, would respond to this uh, as you see things currently? And, and where are the gaps in the book now that maybe we could... Uh, work upon in the future um yeah yeah my my feeling is that they'll because of this the collaborative nature here where we have clinicians and engineer working together i think that'll sort of set the pace uh, the fact that we're saying things that they could relate to is wonderful right because that's familiarity breeds content and sort of invites you in but i think the perspective i mean i learned a great deal from both your chapter and fedora's things i didn't know things that some <laughs> similar to you I, I feel like uh you know the next edition will which will be warranted you know some sometime in the future again as we sort of integrate the knowledge and pull it all together, as we understand each other's side better, uh, I think it'll allow us to, to talk to each other more. Th that's really the essence of this, right? Is the conversations and the discussions and making sure in your conferences that you do have sessions that, that do have cross-fertilization, right? As opposed to engineers kind of stand in their corner and clinicians are doing their thing. Uh, we, we really need to be interfacing a great deal and and the more that the engineer learns about the clinical world and what works and what doesn't i i'll share with you a personal story so when i was growing up my my mom my mom was a nurse you know my my father passed away very early age and mom became a nurse to to support us and i i grew up thinking i was going to be a, a doctor because uh, i you know i i emulated and uh, admired my mom and what she was doing to help folks she was also a midwife and i used to go with her uh but my my path was changed because <laughs> i met yc you know um he had already retired and uh kind of doing uh going to medical school and waiting for more years just wasn't the timing wasn't gonna work so i begged and pleaded for him to kind of come out of retirement and have me as the last student but that my that, that desire to help patients and understand the clinical side has always been part of my nature in fact when i was fortunate to turn full professor uh, in my career i was spending one day in the clinic where i would go with my colleague friends and sit through ground rounds and listen to what works and what doesn't so it, it's only that kind of penetration that I think gets gets these sort of collaborations. And that's why I'm sort of now moving away from university, sitting in a translational environment. Uh, my, my whole goal is to work with clinicians to take technologies to bedside. You know that, that that's my yearning. That's uh, that's that's what I define success as uh, personally. So it, so I think by the physicians sort of pulling the engineers in and helping them understand what are the problems, what things work, more importantly, what things don't work, so we can talk about you know uh, the solutions. What, what you have as a clinician that's very essential is the question. All science starts with a question. <laughs> and the better the question, the better the science. So someone like myself that's on the site, you know, can come up with the questions. Every patient is a question. So 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 you 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 can pose that question better than any engineer can. Now, what the engineer can do is help you come up with a an answer to that question. Some answers are more complex, some are simpler, <laughs> some mouse traps are, you know, uh, is more easily integrated into the choreography of practice, others aren't. And that's sort of the art, right? But that that's the beauty of this, is the more we could do to bring the two groups together, uh, the better. And I think the book is a, a great start in that. And I think to answer your question, uh, I think we will, I'm hopeful that we're going to be successful in doing more of this because we need to work together to, to do to do important things and big things, uh, to, to, you know, to help you help your patients even more than you currently are. Yes, Fedor. 
Well, I, I think Gassan actually outlines very nicely. I mean, yeah, as the clinicians, we do have questions. We also have observations, but we are matures in explaining this. You know, in reality, uh, what the, one, the main thing that uh, we do as a vascular surgeons, we're changing the geometry, we are changing the anatomy uh, to change hemodynamic. And that's what we really need a professional or professionals to help us to bridge it between what we do uh, pretty much mechanically to what the results going to be clinically. And I think uh, at least in, in, in my life, uh, it was a, another great fortune to meet Kassan because uh, uh, that was a missing link. Uh, his work really uh, bridged that, that gap that the, we see with he is what we see. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so I think that uh, this collaboration, and I really think that uh, this book may start that more close collaboration between the two areas will be a great uh, success. Yeah, and as, as you mentioned, Cassandra, and just more into conferences. So we have our IVC meeting that we do every year uh, next month. Uh, our 20th year and we have a hemodynamic session that we're all a part of and hopefully you will be able to make it down here physically Gassan, all of you uh, but yeah we're gonna you know talk about uh, the things that we're talking about here and give some case examples and uh, where the gaps are and uh, how we can move forward and uh, you know I think the importance of the, re the relationship uh, that we're developing with Gassan, I think is uh, very useful uh, Gassan and I, and he's got a, 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 a young uh, hotshot in Italy that's working on a computational model uh, on obstruction. And we just got an email earlier, uh, so we got another call set up, but uh, some stuff that I've just never seen before. The, you know, we're, just a, a simple question of, uh, you know, you got a stenosis in the iliac vein, you got all this pelvic flow, why? Are some stenos tight stenoses in some patients asymptomatic, and why are some mild stenoses in other patients very symptomatic? And just that, um, you know. So why would you put a stent in somebody, you know, if, if, if it's tight and, and no symptoms, and, and why would they do? So many questions, and um, this, 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 this is just all day long uh, questions, questions, and questions, and and. Uh, Know, what works what doesn't so raj why don't you bring us home in the last five minutes here on uh, uh anything you want to say in closing dr sumner was a great scientist but he was also a great man he did not have a single dimension he had more than one side i had visited him in his at his home and his hobby was painting and he had some 50 or 60 of those things hung up in his house. And I was taken aback because they were beautiful exhibition quality paintings. His paintings were in the art gallery in Springfield and New York. And uh, these are professional class uh, exhibition quality paintings. And they were simply flabbergasted. I knew he was a great mind. I said, how can, how can the Lord Almighty create a man, not with one great talent, but two talents? Remember, science is all, one is left brain, the other is right brain. And it was flabbergasted. Then, I think it is no secret he was afflicted with Parkinson's disease and started developing tremors and he had to retire partly because of that, mainly because of that, but he never gave up his painting. Those of you who know Parkinson's disease, it's, uh, tremors and handshaking, but strangely, he could continue to paint just as well. <laughs> as he was doing it before. It is amazing. That is grit. That is determination. Just like Stephen Hawkins, when everything was gone except his brain, 
yeah. was still working at full power because he wanted to he wanted to put out he did not want to become a vegetable you know what god gave him he used it to the max and that was his spirit and i think uh, the three of you generously agreed to include many of his paintings in the book is going to be unique because there's no other vascular textbook the beautiful artwork inside it so that's that's going to show the depth and breadth of dr sabna and i think that's a cool yeah the cover has one of his paintings and each chapter opens uh with one of his paintings so yeah 